My name is Kelsey Andrews. I'm an operations supervisor for the Maricopa County Department of Public Health. Um, I work within the Office of Preparedness and Response. It's a long title. Um, and I, I handle pr primarily um, the needs and the plans that are actually operational based. So going out and, and doing what we've planned for. So it's already kind of been mentioned, um, but the five stages of emergency management, that's kind of uh, the areas that we focus on um, when it comes to planning within um, the operation of preparedness and response. Um, but kind of taking a step back, when you think public health, what comes to mind? COVID, yeah, <laughs> disease, disease okay. and COVID. Yeah, um, and, and I'll admit, um, but prior to becoming, um, working for public health, I worked more on the criminal justice side as a 911 operator. Um, so when COVID hit and I ended up getting a job over in Arizona, I was in Indiana at the time, I had absolutely no idea what I was getting myself into. Um, I got hired with COVID along with a lot of people that work in public health all over the country. And I really had no idea what public health truly was. I mean, when we think of public health, we generally think vaccines and clinics, um, testing, um, even I know some public health do um, like foodborne testing and things like that. We don't. That's a separate agency within um, the the county. Um, but things like that. I never really truly thought emergency preparedness with public health because right we think emergency preparedness. We think our fire, our police, um, our emergency management, but not public health. Well. COVID really kind of changed that in uh, realizing what public health brings to the table. Um, we have a our own emergency preparedness um, division within public health, Office of Preparedness and Response. Within that, we have um, a team that's focused on planning, a team that's focused on operations, a team that's focus, focused on logistics, and a team that's focused on special projects. Um, and so that just makes one section of public health. We also have our nurses and our clinic staff. We have clinics all throughout the valley that serve um, the community, including those that um, are marginalized or might not have access to insurance to go to a pharmacy um, or a healthcare provider. Um, we also have epidemiologists um, that are our kind of brain of public health. Um, they do a lot of surveillance and investigations. We work hand in hand with them during responses. Uh, we have our own uh, vaccine strike team that goes out into the community um, for those that can't easily get to a vaccine event or clinic, um, especially during COVID, um, where it was very difficult for a lot of the populations that had some mistrust with going into clinics or healthcare. Um, so public health is, is quite a large, um, ours is a large agency that has very different sections that all kind of come together, especially during a response. Um, for today, I'm going to kind of focus on what I do um, within the Office of Preparedness and Response and kind of just give you a rundown of what we do and how we serve the public um, during those emergencies or scary times. So one of the big components of what we do is planning. Um, we probably have about 20, 30 plans that we operate and maintain within the Office of Preparedness and Response that um, coincide with different types of responses or needs in the community. Um, for example, we have a medical surge plan. Uh, so if during high times uh, like COVID where hospitals were and uh, medical facilities were getting overrun, we have the opportunity to provide um, whatever they need, whether it's additional staffing or uh, resources. We work with um, the state health um, to kind of coordinate so that the hospitals can kind of focus on what they're doing and we can kind of be a go-between. Um, we also do pandemic response planning. Um, we saw that with COVID. We also learned that we were very underprepared um, as everybody in the country and the world was um, feeling. Uh, so we've made a lot of changes in how we prepare for a pandemic uh, and we have specific plans for that. Um, and a lot of those are getting updated even as we speak right now. 
Um, another huge uh, role that we serve is our medical countermeasures plan. It's probably one of our largest plans and most robust that we have. Um, and we have a specific planner that that's their sole um, responsibility is that one plan um, that's probably going to take about a year or so to update after we've learned lessons from COVID. Um, but what that medical countermeasures really means is, you know, uh, those large pods during COVID that you went to, did everybody have a chance to visit one of those? Whether it was um, at uh, medical parking lots, um, there was the state had the large ones at um, the, the football stadium. Um, a lot of them were drive through in the beginning. Um, so those ones where we can handle large quantities of people coming in and provide them vaccines or medications, um, depending on what that response is. Uh, we also work closely with um, our Palo Verde partners, um, with McDem, our emergency management and other local partners, um, providing assistance should there be an incident there that we need to provide medication. Um, we're involved in that planning. Um, so it's a lot of just making sure that we have everything figured out ahead of time with these plans that we know that when we have to go into an activation or a response that we can just go. There's no spending time trying to figure things out and planning. The plan is already there. We just go straight into operations, which is what I do. But a lot of what we do is also providing support to our hospital partners. Um, we are in contact with them um, quite frequently. Uh, you know, if they've got needs, we're available, um, especially during times when they're seeing large amount of numbers. We have a system that we use where we can kind of track if they're on divert, not taking patients, or if their ICUs are overrun, things like that. So we can kind of be prepared and reach out and say, hey, do you guys need something? Um, so that's kind of definitely one of the things that we, we really try and maintain is those strong bonds with our hospitals. And um, we have quite a few in this county, um, including trauma centers. Um, those are obviously our big concerns. If the trauma centers are getting overrun, there's definitely a concern that we need to start talking about and seeing how we um, as public health can support our hospitals so that they can support the community partners. And again, I've kind of talked about this. Um, we work with not only um, hospitals and medical facilities. Uh, we also sometimes work with our long-term care partners. Uh, we've got thousands of large and small LTCs throughout our county. Um, during COVID, it was very difficult for them to be able to get vaccines um, and living in congregate, congregate settings, um, often dealing with the, the aging population. There was a lot of risk. Um, and so we worked um, heavily to ensure that we were vac providing vaccines to our long-term care facilities because uh, they couldn't easily just go up to one of those pods or go to a pharmacy. Um, so we were able to bring the vaccine to them. And that's what kind of kicked off our strike teams that go out into the community um, is first working with our long-term care partners during COVID. Um, so basically we, we serve as that support function. Um, we might not always activate when other partners are activated, but we're always there supporting when needed. Um, so again, we've kind of already gone over this a little bit. Um, just making sure that we're doing everything on our part to ensure that we can help the community, um, whether that's ensuring that we're exercising our pods, which are very uh, cumbersome to put together, especially when you're serving thousands in a day, um, eight lanes, providing vaccines or medications, depending on the incident. Um, we, we have to prepare for that. And so we're, we're required, um, and we put it on ourselves as well to make sure that we're doing exercises. And sometimes that means we work with community partners to ensure that we have those connections and that we're able to, uh, build off of that so that we can serve the community. Um, and I don't know, is anybody here an MRC volunteer? Medical Reserve Corps? So that's that's another um, resource that falls under um, 
the Office of Preparedness and Response within Public Health is our Medical Reserve Corps or our MRC volunteers. So they often work alongside of us during all of these incidents. We um, are a large public health, but we in no way can serve 4.5 million um, residents and growing all by ourselves. Um, so we have thousands of um, community members that volunteer through our Medical Reserve Corps. So if you're interested in volunteering with public health and getting to be part of some of these exercises or um, actually working alongside of us uh, during responses where we might have a pod activated or events throughout the community where we need vaccinators or we need community members that are talking um, with people coming in. So we have both medical and non-medical roles within the MRC. Um, so if you're interested in that, I highly recommend you look into it. So one thing I wanted to mention, um, this is not done through public health, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, is that during a declaration, during an emergency, um, oftentimes people need to leave their homes right away, um, leaving behind their medications. Uh, and so there is a program called the Emergency Prescription Assistance Program or EPAP. Um, when there's a declaration of an emergency, whether it's a fire or flood, tornadoes, um, anything along that line, the EP EPAP program is activated and they can work with over 72,000 um, pharmacies in order to get access to prescriptions or medical grade equipment that's been prescribed to you. Um, they generally can provide you with a free 30 day supply. Um, however, I would um, in any way check with your, um, your, in your health insurance companies, Medicare, um, private insurances. Generally when there's some sort of disaster, um, they have the ability to, to work with you in order to um, help you get access to those medications or medical grade equipment. So always start with your insurance companies, but during large scale incidents um, where there's evacuations or people are needing to leave their homes, their areas for whatever reason, um, EPAP does exist to assist with that. And I know this has already been touched on several times, um, but ready.gov really is a great resource. <laughs> as it's been um, we, we like to use it um, when community members are kind of asking us, um, like, how do we create our own plans? Um, Cause the, you know, they'll, we'll get people that ask us, well, can we get copies of your plans? It's like, it's, our plans are to serve the entire county, um, all the residents, everybody. With ready.com, that's a, a program that's available with resources that serve you, specifically you and your family. And they have all sorts of resources for children, um, for elder adults, uh, anything. They've got several different languages. Um, so I definitely highly recommend looking at ready.gov if you don't have your own um, personal emergency plan um, or resource kit, um, things like that. So I would definitely utilize, save that resource and go check it out. Uh, so if you have any questions, um, related to healthcare concerns, um, vaccine, anything like that, we actually have our own call center that we call the care center. That seems to be a theme today. Um, and it, uh, they basically are kind of the brain of public health. They take all the information in and they have all the resources to provide out to direct um, people that call in um, with health related or sometimes not health related um, questions. Um, so they, they actually formed during COVID. We're really thankful to have them because without them, it's, it's really hard to get the information you need and get to the right resources. Um, so they're, they're the go-to they're available Monday through Friday. Um, and they can do different languages. Um, and they also have for hard of hearing the TTY line. Um, they're trained in that. Uh, so definitely if you've got any questions or if there's anything, um, that you're concerned about, chances are they're going to be able to get you to the right source. Um, and also I know it's been mentioned the heat, um, the heat and the cooling centers. Um, I just checked and it looks like the heat relief site network, their map, the interactive map that shows everything, um, will be live again on May 
first. So that's coming up. So you'll actually be able to search the different um, cooling centers, respite centers, um, that are available all throughout the county. Uh, it does appear that the list has expanded. Um, and there's also information um, on the Heat Network's um, website that shows how you can also be one of those resources listed so that people can go when they need to cool down. Awesome. All right. Thank, thank you, you so much. Let's give Kelsey and Tina a warm thank you.